Crash Test Diva. I'm your host, Christy Eikers. This week, we have loads to discuss. We are talking Passover with the Yiddish Yapper, Easter cocktails with Annie, and some of you may have seen on social media that I took a quick little trip to London over the weekend. One of our favorite listeners, Christy Wodak, has requested a little recap from this transatlantic adventure. Now, a few weeks ago, I introduced a segment called A Look Under the Hood. It's a chance for us to take a deep dive into a topic, or maybe it's an opportunity to get a glimpse into my own life. I don't have any fancy bumper intro for this. So let's just say, here's this week's edition of A Look Under the Hood. Before the holidays, you may recall an episode called Furls and Ikes. This is where I shared some stories from my lifelong friendship with Derek Furley. Now, I did this episode to celebrate his 50th birthday. In addition to that, I also hosted a party at my home, and we had two surprise guests fly in, our friend Tad Schmitz from Orlando and our friend Tony McNeil from London. Well, this weekend, Tony celebrated his 60th birthday, so Furls and I flew over to take part in the festivities. We met up with our friends Mark, Paul, and Nelson. Now, for those of you who need an org chart, an oral org chart of how we are all connected, well, you might have to rewind this segment, but here it is. In my early 20s, I worked for Disney World, and that's where I met Mark Howard, you know, our reoccurring guest. He's from Fort Lauderdale. He's a bounce dryer sheet enthusiast. Well, a few years after we met, he started dating a Brit, Paul McNeil. The two of them then moved to Minneapolis. Now, this is a time where Furls and I were living in St. Paul. We were roommates. Anyway, Paul's brother, Tony, he came to visit one time, and that's how we met him. Oh, and Nelson? Well, he's this darling Aruban Dutch guy who is Paul's partner. Yeah, Mark and Paul are no longer together, but they remain best of friends. Keep up, people. Okay, just kidding. I know it's a bit confusing. But it, it doesn't really impact the story. I just wanted to give you a little background. Okay, back to London. So when Furls and I stopped being roommates, he moved to Manchester, England. And he and Tony started to spend loads of time hanging out. Derek also hung out with this gal named Elsa. Now, I've heard tons of stories about Elsa over the years, but I've never met her. I knew I was going to like her because way back when Bridget Jones' diary was brand new, she told Furls to send me a copy. I was one of the first people in the States to get a copy of that book. Anyway, Furls had not seen her for 18 years since he left Manchester, and we met up with her for lunch at a pub in Covent Gardens. To say we were kindred spirits might be an understatement. I think Furls, quite honestly, felt like a third wheel as the two of us got on so well. Elsa is one of the most quick-witted gals I've ever met, and she's got this amazing ability to tell a story. I will definitely be having her on a future episode. You guys are going to love her. That night, we met up with Tony at the Tower Bridge, aka the London Bridge, and Tony had his gal Julia and this lovely couple from Germany, and we had an amazing dinner, and then we took a really fabulous picture that I'm going to post in the show notes. It might look photoshopped, but it's not. Saturday was the day of Tony's big party. Now, he's been planning this for over a year and a half. He kept telling us he booked some surprise talent, and he wouldn't tell anybody who it was. He rented this historic hall and had over 150 guests. It was quite the production. There was endless beer and wine, fantastic Thai food, two very funny comedians, and then there was the surprise act. And it was this Neil Diamond impressionist. He was so much fun, although I don't think he had on Neil's signature ankle boots. I, on the other hand, I was wearing these fabulous boots. Okay, they were fabulous until I danced in them for three hours. Remember, Furls and I love to dance, and we took full advantage of dancing. Well, we danced to the Impressionist, but then we also danced to the great music afterwards. What I've realized is, Mama here, she's too old to be a slave to fashion. Um, I need to, for future reference, dance in flats. 
I mean, I think my back and my feet, well, there's, I'm still recovering. Let's just put it that way. We'll put some photos and maybe even a video in the show notes. It was an absolutely incredible night. And Tony was just in his element pulling off this production. He was downright giddy. Sunday, we had a traditional British brunch at a restaurant that's been around for decades. We met up with one of Paul's friends, Martin. To say Martin is a character is an understatement. He entertained us with loads of stories. Martin is this bougie hairstylist who has quaffed the hair of the likes of Barbara Bush and Marla Maples. Yeah, let that one sink in. Well, he also appears on the UK's version of Big Brother. He's a panelist in their after show. We don't have this kind of format here in the States for our Big Brother, but he's a panelist. I know why they have him on the show, because he is very funny. At one point during lunch, I was laughing so hard, my stomach hurt. I'm going to link to both Elsa and Martin in the show notes, their Instagram accounts, so you can follow them. One final highlight to my trip was a visit to Lush. You know the all-natural bath and beauty place? Well, I went with our chemical-loving, recurring guest, Mark Howard. I wish I would have had like three hours to spend in this store. It was incredible. It was three levels. They had everything. It was absolute sensory overload. Now, I was actually on a mission to find a product we can't get in the States. Remember when Annie and I talked about moisturizers and she told you about the Lush Scrubby? You remember the one my mother called a turtle? Well, supposedly, they had some perfume with the same amazing scent, but it was only available in the UK. Sadly, when I asked about it, they told me it was a limited release scent. They thought they produced enough for two months, and they sold out in two days. So sad, but really, if it's that popular, they must be re-releasing it, right? I jotted down these highlights as Frills and I flew back to Minneapolis yesterday. It was a whirlwind of a weekend. It was a once-in-a-lifetime trip, and I'm feeling pretty darn blessed to have such a great group of friends in my life and to meet such interesting new people. I hope you enjoyed this very personal look under the hood. Please let me know if you liked it and you'd like to hear more. Also, 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 also. I've got three bits of news for the also segment this week. Number one, we will be going on hiatus for the month of April. While I love doing the show, it takes time to put all the segments together and mama needs a little break. Have no fear. I'm already working on May content and booking some interviews. I, I just need a little time to catch my breath. Secondly, after the release of each new episode, our reoccurring, bounce dryer sheet loving, slightly OCD tipster, Mark Howard, usually calls with feedback. You may recall me talking about the Puma scouring stick in episode six. You use it to clean your tiles, tub, and toilet. Well, when I mentioned it on the show, I may have mispronounced it. I was saying either pumice or pumice. I, I, I might have even said, I don't know what it is. Well, believe me, I now know. He can't let it go. He just hates the pumice pronunciation that I used. He squirms. To him, it's a little too close to the word, you know, if you replace the M with a B and drop the E. Well, anyway, it makes him squirm. So while we were in London, he brought this up again. He again went off on me on the darn pronunciation of pumice. I'm sorry for the faux pas. My new BFF, Elsa, was in the car when this happened. And she was kind enough to record this little memo for me. To clarify, it is not pumice rock, it is pumice stone. Well, thank you, Elsa. That's a much kinder delivery than Mark's way of talking to me about that. I'm going to ask Annie to jump on for this part of also. Annie, are you there? I am. I am. Oh, okay, good. Well, now, Annie, last week, if you remember, episode 15, I told a story about my trip to the girls' state tournament, state basketball tournament. And um, you said you didn't really recall that story too well. Is that correct? I did not. I did not remember the cheer. I did not remember your stress over the layups. I did not remember any of that. Well, yes, Other than I that, pro- you guys went. I remember yeah. that. 
Yes. So I have to tell you, I looked all over to find a picture of me at that state tournament. And when I say looked all over, I brought in some bins that are labeled memories to sort. And I, I had no luck with digging through the bins. So the bins may or may not still be in the middle of my living room, by the way. Um, and then I um, unearthed some more like treasures in the course of doing this. I found a package of negatives that say 1985 Girls State Tournament. Okay, so I know there were pictures taken because I found the negatives. I know that's impressive that I found those. That anyway. is impressive. Uh huh. So I I had no idea. I knew there were some pictures for this. I finally unearthed two boxes that came from Mom's attic when she moved, and they were my high school scrapbooks. And so I thought I treasures. I thought I found. The, the scrapbook and so I was so excited and she had carefully packed them in big garbage bags around you know in these boxes and they survived the attic for 30 years and so I open them up and I'm so fired up and I find one that's like junior high to like sophomore year and then I find one that's junior senior year I find one that's all my 4-H stuff and I find another one that's I don't even remember but in the sophomore year one, it goes straight from the winter formal to prom. There is no <laughs> girls' state high school tournament. So what does this mean? Uh, this means I created a separate flipping scrapbook of the state tournament. And guess what? No, no photos. I can't find that scrapbook it's a, anywhere. It's, so, a, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. So there is one entire scrapbook of my trip to the state state tournament gone. So I'm throughout the day sending you pictures of the treasures I'm finding while I'm digging for this. And uh, and so at one point you did what? You ran to your office to find what? I ran to my office to find a plastic like target bag filled with photos that mom had given me that I was in. They were just photos of me throughout my life and mostly it's an awesome fashion show so oh, I'm sure you know I kind of knew it 80s was in there. fashion oh yeah awesome 80s fashion and I I'm like I have a picture from that tournament where I'm wearing those pants that I made out of upholstery fabric so I ran up there I'm digging through and I pull it out <laughs> and I find it except it's not you in the picture it's Kendra no. Carter she sends this to me she has a picture of Kendra and her in her fancy pants, and they're like hanging out uh, after the game. Because um, she's got a medal on. Right. Okay. Yeah. So Annie has a picture with Kendra. She doesn't have one with me. And so she, Annie kind of says to me, "Why would I get my picture taken with Kendra?" And I Why said, "Why would I? I wonder." <laughs> I said, "Well, she was one of the stars of the team, whereas I was just like low pine. man on the bench you were there." Pine. So. I was on the pine. So that is why you got your picture taken with Kendra okay. Carter. She was kind right. of a big deal. Okay. All right. So fast forward, I decide that after I've dug through these scrapbooks, I need to go and talk with a couple of my high school friends. So I arranged a coffee with them. Yesterday, I met Kendra, the star of the game, one of the stars of the game, and Lynette Dreheim for coffee. And I brought the scrapbooks. And let's just say um, we maybe made a little bit too much noise in the Starbucks in Mankato. Oh, and I can only imagine. There was some cackling going on. At one point, they start to talk about the podcast. And Lynette just looked at me and she said, I, 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 if I keep listening to your podcast, I'm going to go poor because I buy everything your sister recommends. She said she bought every moisturizer. She's like, I have to quit listening or I'm going to go poor. So, oh, keep listening, Lynette. Keep yes, listening. Yes. And then today I went and got my taxes done. And my accountant, Rita, she said, oh, I um, bought the nuts and the chocolate for my husband for Valentine's Day that your sister recommended. I'm telling so, you, people. There you go. Good, good, good endorsements. But while we were sitting there, Kendra looked at me and she's been listening and she said, no, do you guys um, have any recommendations? Have you taken any um, stain removers for a test drive? And lo and behold, Annie had just said to me last week, hey, 
I've got a stain remover we need to talk about. So, Kendra, um, you ask and you shall, uh, what is that? Ask and you shall receive. Annie is here with a stain remover. So for this week's episode of A Test Drive, here, let me play the bumper music. Okay, Annie, share your stain remover. All right. So as you know, I love CARE 11. And on CARE 11... <laughs> I believe it was... For those of you who aren't local, (laughs) CARE 11 is our NBC affiliate. And she is I talk about it all the time. Oh, my gosh. So they had done a story. Now, this was probably about the time, maybe between the the Super Bowl and the Olympics. And it was about this guy named Patrick Richardson who owns a store called Mona Williams at Mall of America. And he teaches laundry boot camp. And they did a story on him. And, of course... Teaches laundry boot camp to whom? Yes. To anyone who wants to sign up to take it, it used to be called something like Dirty Laundry and Dirty Martinis, but Mall of America wouldn't let him serve the martinis, so he had to kind of revamp the program. Now, back up, does he have a store out there where there's washing yes, machines called, and he teaches? No, 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 no. It's a okay. very high-end designer, beautiful store. Oh, and okay. he was a buyer for, I think it was Neiman's and somebody else, and he has the same major I had in college, textiles and clothing, and... And so I watched this fascinated. Like, he's like, no dry cleaning. Everything you need to do, you can do in your washing machine. He had products. And one of them was for what he called organic stains. So like wine or like cooking oil or, you know, food stains, things like that. And it was a product called sodium percarbonate. And so, of course, I ran right to my computer and went right to Amazon and ordered it. And it came, and it comes in a big bottle, and it's like a white powder. And, you know, there's a lot of science on it. I'm not going to go into that. You can, I'll, I'll send the link for the story, because I found that. Okay. Because so he talks about other we'll stains. We'll link to the story, like, and then we'll link to this yes, product. Like lipstick and things. But um, basically, I had three things that were stained. I had this really cute shirt of mine that I dropped like a gob of uh, artichoke dip on. Um, I had a Paul's favorite shirt that got a bunch of uh, like fat from a turkey spilled on it during Thanksgiving, which okay. was sort of my fault. So I felt responsible. And then Ellie had a cream colored tank that had, I don't know what it was, but like brown spots. So I had washed them. Nothing happened. I washed them with a little bit of bleach, which is usually my trick. Nothing happened. So I bought this sodium percarbonate. I put it in a big bucket. I filled it with hot water. I poured in a few capfuls. It didn't seem too scientific on the special how much to pour in. So that's what I did. I soaked them for several hours. Okay. Then I wrung them out, ran through the wash. All the stains are gone. Gone. Are you kidding me? And this bottle, now off the top of my head, I forgot to look it up. I don't think it was more than $10. And this has many uses in it. Wow. So... I'm saying he had some pretty great products. He also talked about not using dryer sheets because essentially... Oh, 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 wait, wait, back that up, Mark Howard. Yeah, oh, yeah, sorry, Mark. But what did he say? What Mark he Howard, said, for those of you, tune into one of our first episodes. Mark Howard is a super fan of dryer sheets, but okay, Annie, what? Well, what he said is dryer sheets essentially melt onto your clothes, and so that's not a good thing. Right. He suggests taking a yard of aluminum foil, balling it up, and throwing it in your dryer, and that will take care of static and things like that. Oh. So I went online to see if I could go to Laundry Boot Camp because I figured there was probably more than was in right. this little story on CARE 11. Um, the February class had been sold out, and they don't have the next class set up yet. So I'll keep you posted if I get well, to go. I might want to take that with you. You know, our mother is the queen of getting stains out. So. She is really good. But this guy does not send anything to the dry cleaners. Wool suits, cashmere. You are kidding me. Silk. Okay, Her, I think everything. we need to take, I think you and I need to go do this boot camp um, for a <gasps> test drive and come back with a whole nother um, yeah. uh, segment. So yes, amen. Yes. Well, I can't wait. So Kendra, there you go. And Lynette, you mentioned that you might need this for your husband's uh, uh, shirts because he tends to spill a little. So for I both think of this you, is it. Yeah. That we dedicate this segment to Kendra and Lynette. There you, there go. you go. Ask and you shall receive, Kenny. Okay, Annie, don't go anywhere. Now we have another part to this test drive. We talked about it last week. It is 
the cocktail for Easter. And for let, let me just back up. For those of you, we've talked about it before. For every one of our gatherings, Annie creates a little signature cocktail. That's kind of her thing for hostessing. So I asked her to come up with, I'm hosting Easter, but I said, will you please come up with the signature cocktail? So tell everybody what you did and your helpful volunteer um, who helped you. Yes. Well, so I went online and I was researching holiday or Easter holiday cocktails or spring cocktails. I was looking for things that were pastel colored, things that were uh, lightly flavored, not heavy, no bourbon, no whiskey, lightly flavored cocktails. And I was looking for things that didn't have a lot of ingredients because I don't like to have to buy a lot of weird ingredients. Mostly my husband doesn't like me to have to buy a lot of weird ingredients. So there you that go. was my criteria. Now, I uh, texted Melissa, our sister-in-law, and I asked her if she wanted to come over and sample with well, me. Well, I should say after the last episode, she had volunteered. If we were ever test driving um, the cocktails, she would come over to help. So, yeah, taking one she, for the team. She came right over. And Paul even stayed around to test with us, although these are not his kind of drinks. So we didn't really pay much attention to what he said, but we let okay. him stand with us. His vote so. did not count as didn't much count as your that votes. much because okay. he doesn't drink these kind of drinks. All right, so I had three things. I had a pink cocktail, a yellow cocktail, and an orange cocktail. We're going to start with the orange, um, which I was so excited about. It's a creamsicle mimosa, and mm, so it's orange, I love creamsicle. Right? Me yeah. too. So I was really excited. So it's orange juice, heavy cream, and champagne. And you Yum. just, I know. And you could, this made like, more, it made four, but basically it's, you know, a part of orange juice, a just a shot of heavy cream, uh, not even a shot, just a dash of heavy cream. And then you top it off with your Prosecco. Well, we were so excited. Well, let me just tell you, we did not like it. Oh. I'm still on the search for this. I, I, put, I think it probably needs some vanilla vodka or something. It needs something. I will continue to look because there were a lot of recipes out there. I picked yeah. this one because three ingredients and right. it included champagne, which is brunchy right. to me. I That's know. a brunchy thing. Okay, so that one's a no go. And and also it wasn't that orange either, which kind of bummed me out because I was looking okay. for, you know, the the color. It is all about the presentation. Exactly. So then I found something called the bubbly bunny and I thought, oh, okay, again, two ingredients, champagne, so it's that mimosa feel. So the recipe called for pink lemonade UV and champagne. What's What's UV? Okay, so oh, is that, I, oh, it's it's a vodka. It's a cheap vodka. Right. When they're flavored. And, yeah. And I went to... Oh, God. Did you uh, buy pink lemonade vodka? Hold on. <laughs> so I went to Total Wine, and here's why I went. Because I like to support my local liquor store, but Total wine sells all those airplane tiny bottles oh yeah oh good so for you you can just test things but then i had a better idea i used kinky because we know we like kinky is kinky pink. lemonade flavor it's it's kinky liquor i was going for pink pink is what i was okay. really going for here <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. So it, so I used, so basically I made the kinky cocktail that is, um, you know, a long shot of kinky tapped off with Prosecco. It's pink, it's bubbly, it's light. We all, we've had it before. We like it. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah. You can, you know, tap that off with a peep. You'll see in the photos that I'm going to post or you're yeah, going to gar post Garnish me. with a peep garnish on the edge the of peep. your Looks glass. really good. Makes it very festive. So that one was, you know, that was good. We liked it. Yes. Okay. But. There was a clear winner. And okay, the clear drum winner roll, was, drum roll. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, go. It was the lemon meringue martini. Mm. Okay, and so again, mm. it was two ounces of limoncello. Is that how you say it? Oh limoncello? my gosh, I love limoncello. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. So it was that. Danger, danger, danger. It was an ounce of the UV whipped vodka. Again, I just bought the tiny bottles for so, testing. So UV whipped vodka, that's like a, a whipped cream flavored vodka? Like a vodka? whipped cream va vanilla-y kind of flavor vodka. Vodka, okay. Yeah. I think uh, that's what you should add to the first one, but okay, keep going. A half ounce of lemonade and a half ounce of cream. And it says sugar the rim, but, you know, sugaring the rim is just not good enough. I did the frosting <laughs> on the rim dipped in the tiny uh, little beads... The, the sprinkles, the, the pastel, pastel colored sprinkles. sprinkles. 
Oh my so, gosh. This was our clear winner. Melissa and I both like this very much. Paul okay. was okay. He would he drank. He took a drink. He's like, eh, I you know. Okay. But here's Lemon, the bonus Shella, of this. and vodka. I know. Danger, danger, danger. It was very pretty. It's light, but su- sweet, but not sickening. Mm-hmm. If you use those little beads on the edge of your glass, you get the bonus of a little crunching that goes with it, which Melissa and I thought was delightful. Because who doesn't want a crunch when they're drinking? A crunch when you're drinking. You two aren't knuckleheads. And then, <laughs> but I had to warn her, because I don't know if you remember, we did that at mom's surprise birthday party. We, we served, did. Um, cocktails with the rim like that. And yeah. a lot of the ladies had those little dots on their lips. So if you're going to do that, you just have to check. You just have to check. Because it's, we, it, you know, people walk around with that. It's a little bit like having broccoli in your teeth, but more attractive. So just be aware. There you but go. But that's really easy. You just put some frosting. I just bought two frosting, put on a plate, rimmed it, and then dipped it in the beads. And we'll I didn't have even pictures do a very good job that. for the picture, but yeah. I will have pictures to all this. And I would yeah. just say, I would also say this is probably like a one. Uh, or this would be like the Oprah, start strong and then move them on Switch to a different to something one. something else. Yeah. I, I, not, I don't it, think you could really drink. You could maybe drink one and a half. I don't, I don't think you could drink too many of these. But I don't yeah. think you'd want to. Um, it's different than Oprah's lemon drop martini, which you remember we've served that in the past and it's delicious. And that it's got that creamy thing going on. Yeah. Okay. Which seems well, to be a theme lemon. in the drinks that I'm tasting these days. There you I'm go. Sure there you go. Well, thank you um, for this. And, and you're going to be bringing this cocktail to my house to serve. I am because I have my big bottle of lemon cello and I will be getting a smaller bottle of whipped cream vodka. And I will have the martini glasses ready. There you go. We're good thank to go. Thank you, Annie. Happy Easter. Thanks. You too. Yapping, yeah, Yiddish yapping. Yeah, you know that bumper music. It's time for one of my favorite guests, Benjamin Rodich, our Yiddish yapper. And this week, he's going to give us a lesson in not only Yiddish, but we're going to get a little religious education today because Benjamin is here to tell us about Passover. So, Benjamin, Thank you. welcome. Thanks for having me back. Talk to me about Passover. Well, Passover is one of the more ceremonial holidays in Judaism where we not only get together for a meal, but there also are, as I said, some ceremonial things surrounding the meal. So a brief history on Passover. It starts way, way, way back in the beginning of the Old Testament. It's the story of the Exodus. So to reuse some Yiddish words from past episodes, we have Moses, who is kind of a macher, a maher. Around the, around the story, he's kind of a big shot. So he's kind of the boss. He's kind of the, the big guy around Passover. And so the story goes is that these slaves are in Egypt and they're under the rule of the evil Pharaoh. And Moses goes to this bush in the middle of the desert. It's the burning bush. And God comes to him through the burning bush and says, Moses, you need to go and tell the Pharaoh to let my people go and lead them out of the slavery of the Pharaoh and across the desert to the Holy Land. So kind of a big job for just one guy, don't you think? Well, thank goodness he was a maher. A macher. <laughs> we're, 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 still, we're, still, we're, still, <laughs> we're still working on your on the pronunciation of your CH. But how about for this episode, we just say macher. That way, Christy doesn't feel so alone. So anyways, how, Moses Wait a second, go, can we just back up? How do you spell this macher? M-A-C-H-E-R. Okay, ma- macher. Ma- m- do it again. Macher. Macher. Yeah. Oh, there you go. You had you had a little bit of ruach in that, some spirit. Excellent. <laughs> ruach. Oh my gosh. Okay, keep going. Sorry, I interrupted. So, the, the the short of the long is that Moses goes and he has so much ruchmanis and sympathy for these enslaved Israelites, and so he goes and he gathers them all together. And throughout the time of them leaving the enslavement of Pharaoh, all the plagues come down, and he takes the Israelites out of the enslavement of the Pharaoh. And he parts the Red Sea with his magic staff and everything just becomes perfect. And they end in the land of milk and honey, which is Israel. And from this day and all the days of my childhood and all the days of Jewish history and so forward, every year we retell the story of Passover again and again to make sure it's not forgotten that nobody wants to be an oppressed people under the enslavement of a dictator, forced to do things that they don't want to do. And so some of the ceremonial things that we do around the Seder is we have a plate with 
I believe there are seven different little Okay, now we're going to back up because you have to remember, not all my people are um, familiar. Seder, it, um, can you tell people what that is? Yes, a Seder is a meal. So we get to the Seder and we have all of these... We eat all of these foods to help us retell the story. And typically, there's one person leading the Seder. Oftentimes, it's the most wise person of the table or the person who believes themselves to be the wisest. And <laughs> Now, is Seder only held in conjunction with Passover? Uh, there actually are other Seder meals throughout the year that are for holidays that reform Jews like myself don't always okay. celebrate as much as what Orthodox Jews may celebrate. Okay. But you okay. Can certainly call. But the biggest seder of the year is around Passover. Correct. And tell our listeners when is Passover? Well, of course, because we're in the Jewish calendar, which is based on the lunar calendar, Passover changes every year. But it usually always follows right around Easter. Okay. Uh, so there are a bunch of different parts to the Seder. But as the leader talks about the Seder, we eat certain foods at certain times to be symbolic of the different stages of the Israelites leaving uh, the enslavement of Pharaoh. So most importantly at first is this absolutely horrific bread called matzah that only becomes truly delicious to eat when you schmear it or spread it with... Schmear. Yeah, you, I like you, that you word. Put a good schmear, a good schmear of butter... Uh, or mm -hmm. the other components of the Seder meal that we will put onto the matzah to make it more edible. Matzah was a bread that was made as a result of not having enough time for the bread to rise because the Israelites ah. had to leave quickly. So it's a unleavened bread. It's flat. It looks kind of like a lavash cracker. You'll probably see it at your local grocery store right now. And well, So now what's a matzah ball soup? To, so matzah, so... the cracker itself, can be ground down into a flour-like material that you can ah, use to create okay. matzo balls, which when mixed with eggs and oil, uh, turn into somewhat of a dumpling. So it's like a breadcrumb they make into a little dumpling. Okay, exactly. got it. Uh, and matzo, not only is it somewhat flavorless, but one of the downfalls of matzo is that really easy to get in the body, not so easy to get out. So you don't want to overdo it too much. Oh my God. <laughs> you are terrible. Th thanks duly noted <laughs> listeners be warned when you attend the next seder yes the matzah should be not warned. be included on your detox diet so <laughs> okay so uh, so the matzah is the matzah. first part so the, there's the there's a, a the napkin that the matzah the beginning of the meal is put inside of and there's three different layers of it and the centerpiece of the matzah is wrapped in its very own napkin and it is called the afikomen a-f-i-k-o-m-e-n afikomen so the afikomen is the only thing that all of the children at the table are focused on from the moment that the Seder starts. They have to keep a very good eye on it because at some point during the meal, the Seder leader is going to depart the table when the children are hopefully not looking and hide the afikomen somewhere inside of the house. Now, can, can the leader really pull this off? Well, when I was a child, somehow it happened and I always missed it when he, you know, would either be, oh, I'm going to go to the restroom or oh, I've got to go grab something. And all of a sudden it's the end of the meal and it's time to find the afikomen. But oh, okay. it's a big deal. So you make sure that you really, really pay attention to that. Throughout the meal, we use things such as salt water to be symbolic of the bitter tears of the Israelites okay. when they were leaving. We have a um, shank bone that we put on the plate. What do you do with the salt water? So the salt water, we dip parsley inside of it. So the bitterness of the parsley and the salt water is symbolic. And then nobody really likes, some people freakishly love salt water and parsley. I'm just not a big fan. It's just kind of oh, okay. one of those. It's kind of like rabbit food. Yeah, it's just not good. Okay. I mean, fry, fry okay, so you kind of... You, if you take the parsley, we fry a little bit in some oil and a little salt, a little pepper. Yeah, no garlic. kidding, yeah, right? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you skip that yeah. that course. Okay. So, again, throughout the meal, we eat these symbolic foods, everything from um, haroset, which is a chopped apple salad, which is symbolic of the sweetness of the time when the Israelites okay. finally got to the promised land of milk and honey. Uh, and Do you like that? Do you eat that course? I do like that a lot. It depends on who makes that. There's different versions. My Israeli cousins make this incredible one that's pureed. And traditionally, oh. the ones that I have had have been more of a kind of a coarsely chopped apple salad, but all are good when mixed with cinnamon and red wine and all of those other lovely things. Oh, yum. Okay. 
So the meal goes on. Typically, seders can last anywhere from 35 minutes to an hour. And then at the end of this beginning of the, the first part of the seder, then you eat the meal of Passover. And then after you're done with the seder, in some households, not mine, uh, you actually do the ending of the seder, which can be another 35 to 40 minutes and is mostly singing and celebrating and talking about the triumph of the Israelites. When you're done with the meal, it's kind of like on your market set go and you don't get any hints or any clues until you come back begging for them because you can't find it. So you go and look through the house anywhere from in the most peculiar places like a drawer or underneath a bed mattress, inside of a couch cushion, behind a mirror, any, and sometimes my family when we were kids would let us go on for at least 25 to 30 minutes before they'd be willing to give a clue. Oh. So finally, the Afik Homan is found, and it's this loud celebration. And then the best part comes, which is whoever finds the Afik Homan gets to take it back and sell individual pieces of it back to people around the Seder table. Mostly, traditionally, it's you sell it back to the leader of the Seder who hid it. But okay. when I was a kid, I sometimes end up with 15, 20 bucks because I'd break off microscopic pieces of the matzah. <laughs> You've always been an entrepreneur, exactly, my friend. Yeah. There you go. So <laughs> Hustling a buck. So this year, when are you guys celebrating Passover? We're going to be celebrating it on the 31st, I believe it is. Okay, the month. 31st. Yeah. And is that a Friday night? I don't know. Do we have a calendar in front of us? Let's see. I don't know. I think it. The I think it's first a Thursday. Is, going is it to a be Thursday? A, uh, Saturday night. So Saturday night. Okay. Oh Correct. yeah, because Easter's so the first. So actually no. So that means Friday night at sundown on the thirtieth will be the first seder, and then on Saturday night we will also have a second seder that we'll do with some other people that we celebrate with. So one night is like family and then one night is chosen family or how do you guys do that? A lot of people do it like that. I think that one night is traditionally, like you said, family. And oftentimes the second Seder is a time to invite people in who are not Jewish that want to share or people that are just curious about sharing the Passover Seder. Christy's raising her hand. Right I'm now. raising my hand. I think I'd like that invitation. <laughs> it's like the Hunger Games volunteering as tribute. <laughs> So do you know those um, fruit slices that are candied and covered in sugar? They're like a half of a fruit slice that come in the box? Yeah. For some reason, all of my grandmother's generation always used to bring those over as the token Passover dessert. And I got to tell you something. You know how some people weirdly like peeps? You like those? Oh, my God. I love them. It is just absolute high fructose corn syrup coated in sugar, shaped like a fruit, and dyed the color that it would never be in nature. <laughs> but there's something about it, kind of like a peep. We're going to have to link to a little image of those, okay? So yes. we're going to have to find an image and, and link to that. Well, this has been highly educational. Uh, do we have any words we want to review with our listeners that we learned? Well, we talked about Moses the Macher. The mach, Macher. And how he had such ruchmonis or sympathy for ruchmanis. all of the enslaved Israel. Ruchmonis. Ruchmonis. Ruch, ruchmonis. Ruchmonis. <laughs> See, now we're back to the ruch. We're back to the CK again, not the CH, Christy. Okay, keep going. And this is my then, niece's favorite part of our little thing here is to listen to me butcher the <laughs> words because I said I think I should get the words before Benjamin does each episode so I can practice and she goes no it's funnier when you can't say them so uh, this is for everyone's amusement my um poor Yiddish <laughs> so there you go no listen it's part of it's it's it's, it's the learning zest of life I know Without, with practice is perfection right uh, I oy vey I got that one down oy vey oy vey so you know, we really didn't do a ton of Yiddish this episode, but talked about the meal itself and some of the components of the Seder plate and how all of the kids at the table, say, excuse me, the Seder table have shpilkas because they're waiting until the meal gets over. Shpilkas. Shpilkas. So they have such, they've, they've got like loose anxiety, loose energy, like energy. They're, they're so they're excited. excited. Is it they're excited? They're so excited to go and find the, yeah, exactly. They're so excited to go and find the afikomen. Oxycomen? Oh, not, 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 that's, that's a, that's a drug. drug. <laughs> yeah, no, afikomen. <laughs> <laughs> afikomen. But I should say the last thing, though, is the true message of Passover to relate to everybody, because it happens every year, is the idea that none of us should be an oppressed people underneath an enslavement or a dictatorship in the we should all at some point be the brave person to go out there and speak for those who cannot be spoken for and help to lead them to a happier, healthier place where they're free to be who they want to be. 
Well, that is beautiful, friend. And I hope to someday be around your Seder table. Absolutely. Friend, happy Passover. Thanks for Chag being with Sameach. us. Chag well, Sameach to you. No, say that again. Chag, which is holiday. Okay. And Sameach, happy holiday. Oh, well, Chag Sameach. <laughs> <laughs> okay, goodbye. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Returning to London this weekend brought back a very fond memory from my study abroad program when I was 21 years old. With that, let me tell you a story. Halfway through my junior year at the College of St. Catherine, I did a study abroad semester in London. Okay, it was a bit outside of London. I went to Ealing College with my friend Lori Jacobson. And while we were there, my parents came for a long visit. On the day they arrived, I met them at Heathrow. It was very similar to the scene from Love Actually. Anyway, we loaded them into the tube and headed to a bed and breakfast I booked near the school. Lori and I were staying with a family a few miles from the school, and this family had built a little attachment to the side of their home. I don't think it had insulation because I remember wearing a stocking hat to bed each night. I also recall trying to study in bed one night and my head was about the same height as the windows and I could feel a breeze pass by my head. For this reason, Lori and I did a lot of our studying at the local pub near our school. It was just warmer than our home. No, seriously. On one of the first nights in town, we took mom and dad to our favorite little local pub, Three Pigeons. Dad asked what we wanted to drink and Lori and I told him we would have a woodpecker and I told mom she should try one. Well, Dad went up to order and said, I'll have a Guinness and three woodpeckers. Then he asked the bartender, do you know how to make them? Well, cider really wasn't a thing here, and woodpecker is a cider. Uh, so it just came out of a tap. So this was kind of funny. Well, during their stay, I knew Dad would love an Indian meal. He was a much more adventurous eater than my mom. I got a recommendation and a reservation, and we were off on this epicurious adventure. We didn't really quite know what we were eating. At one point in the meal, I bit into this pod. It was, it was bigger than a marble, and I didn't know what to do. But I couldn't really spit it out. I mean, this was a cloth napkin restaurant. I chewed it once or twice more, and then I just swallowed. And then I drained my water glass. I looked at my folks and I said, I'm not sure I was supposed to eat that. Yeah, famous last words. Shortly after dinner, I got a stomach ache. Normally, I would walk back to my place and spend the night, but mom said I should probably stay the night with them. Then she sent dad out to find something for my tummy. He returned after his trip to the quote unquote chemist with a bottle of the quote unquote mixture. Seriously, it was this little brown bottle with the mixture written on it. I mean, it was like the Waltons. It just cracked us up. Well, now in another bag, he pulled out a little bottle of Bailey's. He said, I wasn't sure how the mixture was going to work, so I got some of this to coat your tummy. Well, I survived the mysterious pod eating episode. I'm not sure if it was the Bailey's or the mixture that helped. A few days later, on a Sunday, mom and dad were departing for home. Dad and I had gone to Saturday night mass, and I stayed at their bed and breakfast so we could get an early start back to Heathrow. Before we headed out to catch the tube, dad noticed that there was a bit more Bailey's left in the bottle. Now, we're not a family who likes to have anything go to waste, so dad opened the bottle and passed it around for each of us to take a sip. I think we had two sipping rounds before it was empty. Well, I planned almost every aspect of the trip. All the sightseeing, theater, and meals. This is by far my favorite memory. It was just so unlikely. Sipping Baileys out of a bottle on a Sunday morning with my mom and dad. It still makes me laugh when I think about it. I guess that's a lot like life. It's the little things, the unexpected things 
that tend to bring us the most joy. That's it for episode 16. I hope you enjoyed it. A big thanks to Annie for the laundry tip and cocktail ideas. I hope you all have a very festive Easter and Passover. Thanks, Benjamin, for your very informative segment. You, my friend, are a bit of a mocker yourself. Oh, Lord, help me. Just a reminder, we will be on hiatus for the month of April. In the meantime, please keep in touch with us on social media. Share show ideas, guests, request tips, like Kendra Carter. Okay, that's her maiden name. She's now educating our youth at Mankato West High School under the alias Mrs. Hines. Go figure. We really do love to hear from you. My niece Josie does a great job uploading the show notes and the gallery photos on the website. This week, we have many, so check them out. Some of you told me you don't know how to access the show notes. Well, in your podcast listening app, you should be able to select more details and the show notes will appear. Otherwise, you can always find them at crashtestdiva.com. Remember, bruises are like life. The harder you get hit, the more colorful and interesting they get. Oh, it's the crash.